Sneakers and Cleats, the podcast. All right, take two of the Sneakers Cleats podcast, episode 131. This is Thursday, September 5th. It is the first day of the NFL season and the first day of the next, you know, six months that you'll hear Denver Broncos and Bo Nix out of my mouth every single day. But that's besides the point. Chuck, how are you? I'm doing great, Matt. How are you doing today? I am doing wonderful. I was up a little early. I did some laundry this morning and then nice. came in and... You know, now I get to see your guys' bright, shining faces. I did my laundry at 1 a.m. last night. Why do you you stay up so late? There's work to be done. <laughs> There's always work to be done. Uh, we got a lot on tap for you today, but before we get started, I want to remind everyone, subscribe to our YouTube channel, News 4 and Fox SA. If you're so inclined, download, rate, review the podcast version of this as well. Get it posted a couple hours after we get off the set here, so it helps us out a lot if you give us a five-star rating, rate, reviews, give us feedback. Whether it's positive or negative, feedback is a gift, as uh, fellow podcaster Chad Millman likes to say. So, Chuck McIntyre and I are going to talk about the UTSA Texas State Showdown, the I thirty five Showdown, and their sixth iteration coming to our uh, coming to us on Saturday at three o'clock. I'll be there. You, my friend, will be in Cleveland on Sunday Woo! when you go to the Dog Pound and see the Cowboys and the Browns play. We'll talk a lot about that, who wins, who covers, and lastly, we're going to make some predictions. It is the first day of the NFL season officially, so we got AFC, NFC, and I even did the awards just so I can be totally wrong. So we'll get to all those as well. Oh, you'll be in really good company, I can assure you. And Chuck has a surprise that even surprised me, and I would just like to say right now, I did not influence his picks at all. He he Small sample size. All on his own. Small sample size, but <laughs> and a preseason sample size. Yeah, right. Uh, we'll get the Cowboys win total. We'll get Texans win total. But first, I want to get to something fun. So the Kelsey mix, the Travis and Jason Kelsey cereal mix, they're mixing with uh, Reese's Puffs, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and Lucky Charms into one box. Chuck, are you a cereal guy? And second, would you eat this cereal? I would if I was eight years old. <laughs> But yeah, I was when I was a kid, but there's no way I would touch that stuff now. Have you seen what's in that in those boxes and there it's all reads the same. Most of the stuff I can't pronounce and most of them have, you know, some sort of GMO in there like no, I Ignorant, would not. No. Ignorance is bliss, my friend. Uh, Ignorance yes. is bliss. <laughs> and I'm sure it tastes amazing. That's why we ate it when we were 8 years old. I don't know about the combo of all those. Like Reese's Puffs, Cinnamon, first of all, is it Reese's or Reese's? Reese's. I say Reese's. But uh, Reese's Puffs, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and Lucky Charms. I feel like the combo, like the milk underneath would be like really, really convoluted, wouldn't it? It's the hairy buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> no I don't know. Reese's cereal. sounds too close to... PCs? You said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. I, I love the milk under a cereal, like a, a cocoa, uh, like a Rice Krispies treat or a cocoa, cocoa Krispies. I love that. The Fruity Pebbles, I love those. And after underneath, or, or Cocoa Pebbles, I love those. It just, but I don't know. The milk underneath, I don't, I don't think it would be good. Well, Also, the marshmallows, I don't know. You know, that's going to taste like something that you've already eaten, and they just slapped a different picture on Probably. it. So, yes, they don't really – venture off the res too far when it comes to how they concoct these cereals. So Jack Green brought me Jack Green. a box of the great pumpkin Charlie Brown, and it was something similar to this. What? Of course, it was fantastic. It tasted great. But I don't know if it was because I was so enamored with what was on the box. <laughs> like so, the old Wheaties boxes. Yes, but it was, <laughs> there was so much sugar, though, Matt, I burned the roof of my mouth. So the, were you a household... <laughs> Were you a household that allowed your kids to have the sugary, sugary cereals, or were you one of those households that's just like, no, we're eating Raisin Bran and Bran Flakes? No, I don't – I think they were more – like, my wife was really good at cooking them and making them breakfast, so there was some of that. We didn't say that nobody – you couldn't eat it, but I don't remember them all being – Horrible that for sugar you. High yeah. on it, you know? <laughs> well, we, when I was a kid, we had some we had some houses that where it was like I want to go to that person's house because I know their snack pantry is full and my mom's not looking. That kind of house, and then you have the other houses where it's like we don't want to go to that house. They're going to make us eat broccoli, which I'm sure you've experienced as well. Yes, we had a pretty <laughs> good variety at my house. Although you know, man, I was my go to was spaghettios when i was yeah. a kid <laughs> craft mac and cheese was my mom's go to for that was an elite us. level meal so. right there all right well i just wanted to start off with some fun i was listening to the new heights podcast on my way over here and i was like i don't know i got to ask chuck about that so anyway let's start with some well trivia done. 
I, I got a uh, harder trivia question for you today because I gave you I two, saw this. too easy of one uh, on on Tuesday. So with the Cowboy season starting this Friday or this Sunday, I wanted to ask you: Dak Prescott will start his ninth Week One game on Sunday for the Cowboys. What is the Cowboys' record over his previous eight starts? So he started eight already. What's their record in those eight? I think it's got to be pretty good. Although I know I'm going to get this wrong because it's a darn fine question but you know they played the giants a lot and he owns the giants so i'll start the giants four times okay well then i'm assuming there that's four wins right there and i know mccarthy too since he's been there too you know he always likes to make a big deal about team focus on week one so i'm gonna say it's pretty good but you know i told you my walk across time feels like a walk across the street nowadays <laughs> so i have a hard time remembering what's what has happened not only today but last year <laughs> and 9 years ago give me a record oh you eight. want it right now i want it, yeah give me it let's do okay. it right now cuz we're going to get right into the cowboys so let's do it right now 8 and 2 i'm sorry 8 and, uh 7 and 2 6 and 2 cuz the 8 games okay this will well, be his croatian nine. math and no, play. I'm, uh, no i'm 6 and 2 6 fine. and 2 is yes. your guess yes. all right my the answer is three and five. Really? Yes, they are three and five over Dak Prescott's eight starts on Week One. They lost to the Giants in 2016. They beat the Giants, then they lost to the Panthers, then they beat the Giants again, then they lost to the Rams, lost to the Bucks twice, and then they beat the Giants last year. So all three of their wins have come against the Giants. They have not beat anybody not named New York Giants wow. over the last eight years on Week One. I'm that that surprises me, but oh well. I'm sure today's episode is going to be filled with many things that we can play a year from now and go, (laughs) (laughs) he was not only wrong about the trivia question, but that SOB didn't get one of those teams right in the playoffs. Well, uh, if you just go back to our last Thursday episode when I predicted Clemson will make the uh, national, or uh, Clemson will make the playoff, it looks really bad right now. So I am full of really good predictions. So take everything you hear today. It's a long season. However, um, they are so they're three and five overall, straight up, um, and four and four against the spread. Their average loss was by six points on opening day. They lost by six, excuse me, sixteen to the Bucks, eight to the um, Panthers, and then three, two, and one. So close games generally. But God, where was I? I don't even remember them playing the Panthers. I think I think last year it kind of got into your head. They won forty to nothing against the Giants. So you're like they beat the Giants every time. But they lost the Giants. That's probably eight years it. Ago. I mean, I remember them playing the Panthers once, and that was because I went to the game in Carolina. But that's the only time I remember them playing them. <laughs> All right, we got a lot to get lot to get to. So let's get to that Week One matchup: Cowboys at Browns. Browns are minus two and a half point favorites. Uh, it's Sunday, three twenty-five, Huntington Bank Field, which it was news to me that that's what it was called. Bob, did you know that that's what the Brown Stadium was now called, Huntington Bank Field? Yeah, they just changed it. Yeah, yeah, they, I, went, they had to go with field. They couldn't just say stadium because there already is a. Yeah, there's like stadium. Cleveland Brown Stadium. It's Huntington Bank Field at Cleveland Brown Stadium or something like that. Well, I mean, there already is a Huntington Bank. Oh, stadium. Oh, is that? Yeah. Oh, see, so yeah, I had no idea. This is our resident Browns fan, Bob. Yeah. So he, uh, he. Guess what? I, I ain't calling it that. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna call it the dog pound, and we're gonna go back. Right, that's exactly right. All right, so the over under is 41. Chuck, to you, main storylines as we come into Week One for the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I think they're going to be tested up front, right? You've got two rookies, BB and Guyton, that are going to be starting first rookie offensive lineman duo. I think since 2010 or 2011, it's, like it's been a minute. It's gotten so, healthy. Pardon me? And is Guyton healthy? Guyton is healthy. He had an illness earlier in camp, but he's healthy. Okay. But, but as, our, as I was saying. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. As you, as <laughs> You're you were good, saying, Bob. Yes, they're going to be tested up front. So, but yes. The, the reigning defensive player of the year again on the other side. So. Yeah. You got Miles Garrett. You got one of my favorite guys, Big Z, former Packer. That dude is a beast. I love watching that guy play ball, and he makes plays. So, they're going to be tested. So, Zadarius, be kind to the Cowboys, rookie <laughs> offensive lineman. But, I mean, you talk about having to flip a switch, right? These guys, first of all, BB, learning a new position, by all accounts, is learning it well, but man, these are real bullets that are going to be flying on Sunday, right? Opening day, everybody's going to be hyped. Guyton and BB are going to see things in their life in a speed in which they've never seen it before. So how quickly are they going to adapt to what's going on? A very tough test for the Cowboys in week one, but not one that I think is going to be 
you know, I, I wouldn't put this on a, you know, scale of 10 as it being a 10. You know, I think it's a seven and a half to eight. You know, this is a road game. Right. All road games in the NFL, usually tough, but they have enough talent and they've been in games like this before where they should make a good accounting of themselves and I'll be surprised if they don't. It's not an insurmountable game. It's not a game they can't win. I mean, they're only two and right. a half point underdogs. Browns but- are a little banged up too. Browns are a little banged up, but you look at how just using last year as a measuring stick at how good this defense was at home. 13.9 points per game at home. The best of any unit in any stadium in the NFL. They had an 8-1 and one record at home. They had the best third down percentage at home on defense. They had the best defense by yardage in the NFL all of last year. They had the best passing defense in the NFL all of last year. You're not going up against scrubs. And you're going up against the defensive coordinator and Jim Schwartz, who knows Mike McCarthy in Dallas very well. He was the the Eagles defensive coordinator when they won the Super Bowl. He was a defensive coordinator there for five years. He knows them extremely well. He knows how Dak plays extremely well. So I would I don't think that the Cowboys are outmatched at all in this game, but it is a hell of a challenge to start off the season. No question. And, you know, I think to your point, because they do have other guys in their defensive line, right? Mm-hmm. All three levels of their defense are really, really good. How much is CeeDee Lamb going to play? Is he going to be the CeeDee Lamb that we've all come to know and love and get paid like a rock star? Is he going to be that guy with only two weeks being with his fellow teammates? That'll be a fascinating thing. And then if that's not the case, and I think the expectation would be that it might take a while for CeeDee to ramp up, then how good does then Brandon Cooks and Jalen Tolbert have to be in this game, not to mention 87, who's already pretty damn good. Yeah, when you're talking about the offense, the offensive line is for sure the biggest question. The other question is, how is this running back room going to look? And what, what's the snap count going to be? We've se- seen a lot of Rico Dowdle in the in uh, uh, social media over the last couple of days. It, maybe he's going to lead and be the lead back. Maybe it's going to be Zeke. Maybe it's going to be Dalvin Cook. We don't know how Deuce Vaughn's really going to be used. What's the Tony Pollard, post-Tony Pollard era uh, Cowboys offense look like when you don't have that lead back? Uh, there's a big question mark there, right? right? And I'm curious to know if this Rico Dodal Dodal stuff is all Dodie, right? I was, why do I say Dodal all the time? But I, it's like <laughs> I know it's like Dow Jones Dodal. It's easy to remember, <laughs> Chuck. Again, it's the age thing. You know what is that going to look like? Is it Rico? Is this a smoke screen that he's going to be the guy? But Against a defense like this, do you need a more athletic guy that you can get the ball out to in space? So I think there's, you know, I don't know if it's a smoke screen, but that has to be a consideration for, you know, coaches aren't going to play their hand in the media before week one. And there are going to be a lot of surprises, I think, for both teams, because that's just what this is, especially when the Cowboys hardly played any of their legit players at all during training camp. This Feels like a lot like Christmas Day. Like, you're just going to get a bunch of boxes and see what you get when you open them. This game's going to come down to the trenches. I mean, defensively, are you going to be able to stop the run? You kind of luck out by not getting Nick Chubb playing in this game. Their offensive line is back and healthy. Jack Conklin is back. Jedrick Wills is healthy. Uh, Joel Batinio, is that how you pronounce his name? Batonio. Batonio. I always, I don't know why I can't pronounce his name, even though is I live in San Antonio. relation to San Antonio? San Antonio? <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this too long together. Yeah, Our minds are melting here. Right. Um, are you going to be able to stop the run is another question. I mean, you have uh, Jerome Ford, Pierre Strong, Dante Foreman on the other side, a couple of bangers over there. Are you going? Is Mozzie going to be able to come up big? Is Jordan Phillips going to be able to come up big? Is uh, uh, Linville Joseph going to be up to speed now since that late signing? In yeah, camp? is like, Maris Leofau going to be the starter too? Yeah, I mean, I was a little Overshone, surprised right. that he – but again, this is without the benefit of – you know, being at the practice every single day. So, you know, how how good must Maris Leofau be to get on the field that quickly? Uh, that's going to be fun to watch. Absolutely. And are those guys who suffered those ACL injuries going to be back full strength? Trayvon, DeMarvion, are you going to have those guys back to their peak forms or better a year post-surgery? So. Right. And I'm, I'm curious to see, like, there's something about the Stevens kid that is really intriguing, right? His size yeah. and athleticism and his – he just looks like – he flashes every time they put him in. I know it's preseason, but you know when he gets all the way back with his knee and w- what's going on I with hope, him because he's got another thing going yeah, on. Yeah, I right hope he plays. He was up. DNP yesterday, so. but uh, he just looks different to me. You know, there's some guys that just do. Obviously, his size is a giveaway that he looks different. But 
I just wonder if his role in week 15, 16 is a lot different than it is in week one and two. Bob, is uh, Deshaun Watson back or no? Like, is he healthy? Is he is he the MVP favorite that we saw in, a couple years ago with the Texans? No. No, definitely not. But all we need him to be is a barely competent quarterback. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> a, a, All he's going to do is be a game manager. But the one thing a lot of people don't realize is Conklin's uh, knee injury was every bit as bad as Chubb's. Yeah. People don't, people don't know that. And they switched him over to the left side uh, for, um, this year. And this will be his first start on the left side in like 12 years um, since like college. And uh, so – you got to believe that Michael Parsons is going to be lined up right over the top of him every down. Yeah. And they're going to have to apply a, a lot of help. They're going to have to, you know, rub and chip like crazy on, on the left side of the of the offensive line to give Watson any time whatsoever. It's a good point. It's a good point. And I'm going to be interested how they use Jerry Judy, too, just as a Broncos fan. I'll be interested to see what he contributes early on in the, up across from Mari Cooper. A whole lot of slot, I would think. Yeah, probably. Um, all right, so prediction. Win. Loss or somewhere in between <laughs> for the Cowboys. Always hard to, you know, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not a soothsayer. Don't you, don't. you know, I, my feel is I could look at this a bunch of different ways, right? It's hard for me to really pin down and come up with something that I would feel comfortable saying. Having said that, I'll say Browns by three just right. because it's the pound – They've got, you know, they've had the benefit of an entire off season to get healthy, to get right, even though they are, you know, their injury report looks, a, you know, a little bit different than the Cowboys one for week one. A little, yeah. a lot of names on that list for week one. You know, close game. Maybe the Cowboys have to figure some things out, but I don't know. I can see McCarthy having a couple of things for the Browns that they haven't seen before that work well. And then I think this defense has got something to prove. You, you get one turnover and, you know, maybe you get a, special teams play that'll help you out. I mean, I could really see it go the other way, but if you're sticking a gun in my ear hole and asking me for a victor, Cleveland's two-and-a-half-point favorite, so I'll go with Browns by three. 16-13 Browns or 17-14 Browns. I'm yeah, going to take take a, the under and take the two-and-a-half. It's such a juicy under. It's it, Oh, it, the, the under looks fantastic. Also, we're going to talk – I'm going to use the lines every week in this show – I know we can't bet in Texas, but that's just because of the people up in up in Austin. Your guys are giving away five hundred million dollars a year and don't want to spend it on anything and don't want to recoup that money and use it on something else. That's besides the point. But I am going to use the lines, even though it's illegal in Texas. Um, so I, I would take Browns minus two and a half. I would t- definitely take the under forty one. Is forty one's juicy. juicy, um, juicy. All right, let's get to a Cowboys win-loss prediction. So I want to start there before we get to the Texans and before we get to predictions. You, this will give you kind of a foreshadowing into our into our picks for the season. Yeah. So Aww. Dallas Dallas is over under on uh, wins for the season is nine and a half. It's heavily juiced to the over, so it's most people think it's going to hit the over. What say you? Yeah, I think it's the over. If they don't win double digits, to me, this will be a bad season. And I think they have enough talent. I think there's enough corporate knowledge with McCarthy, the coaching staff, the quarterback, top five defense, 10 wins. I like that. I've got them right at 10 and seven. So 10 and seven is where I've got them at. And I, I, I can't really see them getting too many more wins than that. I'm looking from where my, uh, my seat, my, uh, schedule is here. So they're at Cleveland. I think that's a loss. They win. They'll probably win next week, uh, against new Orleans. You got Baltimore coming in. You always beat the Giants, so I'll take a win over the Giants. At Pittsburgh's never easy. Like, no matter what their quarterback situation is, whether it's Russ or whether it's Justin Fields or right. whoever, that's just a never an easy game. You are home to the Lions, never an easy game. You play at San Francisco, they have your number. They literally literally and figuratively have your number. They're going to lose that game probably. Uh, Atlanta, Philly, Houston, I mean, it's just not an easy schedule. You play Cincinnati on, on uh, Monday Night Football. You, it doesn't get really easier till later when you have Carolina and Washington, but then you're at Philadelphia and home to Tampa Bay in between those. It's just it's not an easy schedule, and I think ten and seven would be a, a, a pretty big accomplishment. I think that's low end for me. I mean, they better win ten games plus. You know, I mean, ten gets you into the playoffs more than likely. Maybe a little more difficult now that they've added the extra game that you can't bank on just ten wins getting you in. Mm-hmm. But you know, the other side of this is just like. In any other sport, right, it's when you play somebody, 
right? If a team has a major injury at the time that you play them, that's a benefit for you, obviously. And it's hard to know because these these schedules are so long. It's who's going to be the deepest team at the end is going to have the best chance to win because the team that starts out the season is going to look vastly different at the end. So it's kind of hard to predict these teams like the Cowboys. I mean, you win 12 games a year, you're going to be playing a playoff schedule the next year, which the league tries to make it harder on you to then keep making the playoffs. So to that point know. though, I see, I don't see the Cowboys as a very deep team. So if you do suffer some injuries in the t- to your top end talent, that you're going to start falling by the wayside later on in the season. We don't, we don't know, know. Right. But we really don't know because you're right. At this point, you don't know because you haven't seen, right? right? But that's not to say, like, if we all think DeMarvion Overshone is a hell of a football player and we, really made a lot do. of plays last year before he got hurt, still working his way back from the knee injury, and he's your backup, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of just looking at that spot in terms of depth. That's two overs here. I, I got 10. He's got a little bit more than 10. And then as far as Houston goes, let's talk about the Houston Texans here for a second. Their win total is almost exactly the same. Nine and a half, juice to the over. You are extremely high on the Texans this year. I am for a myriad of reasons. Obviously, what they did last year passed the eye test for me in a lot of ways, right? Because I honestly was – under the impression when they started the season, this is going to be at best a five-win team. They checked every single question mark that there was, including, to me, the biggest one of all, which was, and I know I've talked about this before, so pardon me if you've heard this. They were amongst the most beat-up teams in the league last year. They were in the top four most beat-up and the only team in the top seven or eight that ended up making the playoffs, and they won a playoff game. Now you get all those guys back. You have a great offseason where you're adding depth, adding starters. They, by all accounts, drafted very, very well in terms of adding to that depth. You've got a quarterback and a head coach and an offensive coordinator that now have a whole year under their belt to quote-unquote work out the kinks, which worked out pretty well last year. Now you can expand the playbook. This is a gritty team. It's got depth. They've got playmakers on both sides of the ball. The receiving core is maybe the deepest in the entire NFL. They did a very good job juggling a mangled up offensive line last year. I like what I hear from the head coach in terms of grit. I think these teams have a tendency to sometimes take on the personality of their head coach. And so if this team learns to play like D'Amico Ryan's played, with his communication skills, with those guys, I don't think there's a damn thing that can stop these guys. I want to say, period. T- the rest of the league be damned. I mean, there's not a team in the league to me that pops like them, top to bottom. Not even the Chiefs. I'm always hesitant to believe in a team that was great one year and then is expected to take the next leap. They came out of nowhere last year, and we just don't know. We don't know what a sophomore season looks like for C.J. Stroud. We don't know what a sophomore season looks like for D'Amico Ryans. And I feel like a lot of times, I don't have stats to back this up. It's just basically watching the NFL my whole life. Whenever a team is this hyped coming in, going from 200 to 1 or 150 to 1 to win the Super Bowl last year, now to like 15 or 16 to 1, those teams don't do well. A lot of times they don't even win a playoff game, and most times they don't even make the playoffs. That's fair because now there are expectations, which there were none last year, so you could say that they were playing – you know, freestyling. They didn't have to worry about any outside noise about, you know, oh God, here come the Texans coming to town. Well, we got to buckle up because we know we're in for a fist fight. That's going to change this year. This is what we talked about too, about playing the playoff schedule. We don't know how they're going to play with a, a more robust schedule in terms of teams that made the playoffs the year before. You're right. Those are all unanswered questions, but given how many boxes they checked last year in the question category, I really like this team's chances this year. So over nine and a half, one hundred percent. I'm taking them. Yep. At te- I'm taking them exactly the same as the Cowboys, ten and seven. I think Vegas is telling you what to think of this team, and nine and a half juice to the over tells you okay, they might be a good team, but I don't know if they're a great team yet. So I'll take ten and seven for the uh, Houston Texans. All right, let's get to our season long predictions here. So Chuck, oh, Chuck, we have to. You are up first. I will go. A- so we remind me who I picked too. <laughs> we got it up. Uh, on the screen right there. Okay. That's AFC for you, Chuck. Okay, I, I, like I said, I felt like I was I was pretty confident with this, as confident as one can be without one game being played yet. So yeah, obviously, I'll, you like the Texans. Texans are number one. Yeah. 
What do, what do you have a problem with on my screen? Let me ask you that. Well, um, I would say the shocker, and like I said at the beginning, I did not influence this at all. He has the Broncos at the three seed winning the AFC West. Okay, so let me tell you this. Just, I'm not mad about no, it, just to I, say. I know you're not, <laughs> and I probably just put the kibosh on your squad, but probably. if we're going to spitball like this when we're talking about crowning a champion next year, two months into next year, so I'm really bad at the prognostication thing, but – what I saw with Knicks, what I saw with how they literally, and I know again, I know it's preseason. That was that was a different kind of football team playing a preseason game. I don't know that I've ever seen to a man a defense play like they were trying to inflict bodily harm and trying to bury guys. Every single play, there just seems like all of a sudden there is a mindset flip. And I know this is a really good defense, right? And they've always been hyper-competitive, but this is a kind of team that looks like they're going to fight to the death every single week. And if they just get something from a young quarterback, and I think the organization's done a pretty good job filling in around them, I just think they could be one of those teams that is gets off to a nice start, sneaks up on some people, and then... They create some momentum that some magic can happen. Granted, I, as we sit here today, I know that that's 100% me just spitballing. Throwing darts. But, again, some of these teams that we think are going to be great, as we sit here today, based on what they did last year, there's going to be a six-win team and probably two of them, and they don't even get in. Yeah, so going head to toe, Chuck, you in the AFC, you got Texans at the one seed, Ravens two, Broncos three, Dolphins over Bills and Jets in the AFC East. Got the Chiefs at five, the Steelers at number six, so no Bengals, no Browns, and then we have seven is the New York football Jets. I just like the way Soleil also. Sala. Uh, was that his name? Yeah. Sala. Oh, like Soleil. Soleil. Like Soleil Mignon. <laughs> Oh, he, he's a he's a nice player. He's have, a nice coach. And you have the Texans beating the Denver Broncos in the AFC Championship game. I, but, it, I told you if that yeah. happens, I'll kiss you. Like I, I will. And I said you can blow me a kiss and then buy me lunch. I'm really never mind. I was. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, Not that I there's will anything buy, wrong with that. No, yes. you can do do what makes you happy. I will buy you lunch. Uh, I will buy you lunch for a week if the Broncos make the AFC. So Championship again, game. I'm spitballing some of this stuff, but I like the way the. That coach coached the 49ers, their defense. I like the way that coach. Speaking of the Texans. Or, or speaking no, of the Jets. The Jets. Okay. Salah. Is done with coaching toughness. And if they can just stay healthy and obviously keep the quarterback upright, which remains to be seen. I mean, that's a huge question mark. That There's just one of those teams you don't want to play every week. And if they – have a quarterback, that makes them even more dangerous. All right, Chuck, NFC for you. You Kind of running it back here. Niners, your one seed. Two seed is the Cowboys. Three seed Atlanta. Four seed Packers. Five seed Philly. Six seed Lions. Seven seed Bucks. Dallas, I didn't figure out the last one. but I, Dallas, two, Dallas two uh, is, is different than what I have, so... I, I mean, a lot of it's different than what I have, but Dallas too, and then the Packers making it to the Super Bowl. Because a little bit, they'd have little to bit go homer. through the Cowboys. A little bit homer, so. but oh yeah, of course. But again, now we take the the youngest team the NFL had seen in six years, and now they're younger. And this is a team that I think, if we're being fair, may have not have been the worst team on the football field when they played the 49ers in that football game last year. If the quarterback makes a couple of plays, so rematch of last year, the I think Packers so. Beat the Niners in and San Francisco. It's tough or in Santa Clara. You know, and if it really does get to that, if the 49ers are at home for that game, it'd be hard to pick against them legitimately if we ever got to that point. But again, that's the beauty of freelancing and freestyling here as we sit in early September and no footballs have been kicked off yet. All right, so Packers, Texans in Louisiana in the Superdome. Sign me up for that. What's, that who, sounds who, like a lot of fun because I believe wins? it's on Fox too. Who, who wins? The Texans would win. Texans win the Super Bowl. You I, heard it here first. Because I think, again, if, at this point, as we sit here today in September, 
The Texans feel like a more gritty team than the Packers do. Packers gonna, are a wee bit more finesse. I'm going to speed through mine because I know we got to still got to get to the UTSA games or UTSA okay. game before we get oh, out of here. I'm sorry, I thought we had all day to do this. I mean, I'm, I I'm sorry, I wouldn't have gone on so much about. I think Luis something and, that guaranteed it's going to be at least half wrong. Luis and Bob have something else to do, I'm sure. So let's start with. The AFC here. I got the Bengals in number one. I love the Bengals this year. As soon as long as they get Jamar Chase into uh, into camp and he is playing by week two, week three, I love the Bengals. And as long as Burrow can stay healthy, that's the thing. Is can Joe Burrow stay healthy? I hope so. I really hope so because he, they're such a fun offense to watch when he does. So I got the Bengals at the one seed. I think they're going to be tied, but the week two game next week is Bengals at Chiefs. I think that can come down to decide the tiebreaker for the one seed. So Chiefs get the two seed in my bracket here. Uh, the Jets get the three seed, and I believe I had the Colts at the four seed. Uh, I think that the AFC South is very similar to the NFC East, where there's always a different winner. Um, the Colts, or excuse me, the Texans have won it a lot seven times since 2010, but I think the Colts, I love Steichen. I like Anthony Richardson a lot, and I think if they can stay healthy, health is always the great equalizer. Yeah. If they can stay healthy, I think that they will narrowly edge and out you, the Texans. And you feel like Jacksonville's probably this close, too, to making some sort of move. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to be shocked if they go out and have a great year and prove everybody wrong. Just based on how many guys, veteran guys that they cut, I think they like who they drafted, and that team – you know, you're not you're not sure what you're going to get week to week, but they've got some talent too. Jacksonville's one of those teams that can go 12 and five, and I won't be surprised, or five and 12, and I right. won't be surprised. I'm with you. So I got Colts there. I got the Texans making the playoffs. I got the Ravens making the playoffs, and I got the Bills making the playoffs as well as the wild cards. My AFC championship game is um, is uh, Bengals and Chiefs in Cincinnati. I think the Chiefs go in there and they win and they go to their. Third Super Bowl in a row. They're fifth in the last seven years, and I just want to blow my brains out because my whole <laughs> wife's family is Chiefs fans, and it's just going to be See, but here's unbearable. the thing. First of all, we don't want you talking like that. <laughs> no. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Secondly. Well, then I hope you're yeah, right, okay? Here's the thing. <laughs> Secondly, what are the what are the odds? <clears throat> pardon me. What are the odds these guys are going to win three in a it's row? never happened. Like it's not happening. It's not happening. I don't have them winning. So It's not happening. All right, let's get to the NFC real quick. I got the uh, Detroit Lions as the one seed in the NFC. Detroit uh, gets the bye. I got the Eagles winning the uh, NFC East as the three seed. The Cowboys come up in as a wild card in the six. I have the Atlanta Falcons winning the NFC South. They are going to play the Green Bay Packers. That's the 4-5 matchup. And then San Francisco, I have playing the Rams. There's actually a lot of divisional matchups there with the Cowboys, Eagles, and uh, 49ers, Rams. I love the Rams, man. Even though they don't have Aaron Donald, I think they're a young, good, gritty team. Matt Stafford is going to be back, and he's going to be leading that team to victories. So I have the Packers playing the Lions. In I think I had the – did I have the Packers? Sorry. I Yeah. Pull that one more time. Yeah, sorry. Packers. Thanks, Luis. I, I didn't print them out for myself, so I was going off of what's stated on the screen. Packers Lions uh, in Detroit in the NFC Championship game. Lions advance to the Super Bowl, and I have the Lions winning their first Super Bowl in NFL history. And Jared Goff, I think he plays 15 of his 17 regular season games in a dome this year. He's going to have a dome the entire way through the NFC Championship game. I love the Lions, man. Give me some more Lions. I can't go against your pick. I kind of like your sneaky Atlanta pick, too, because it's, you know, Kirk Cousins is capable of putting up numbers, right? Even if they're in blowouts, he's going to get you a bunch of points in the second half. But if they have a guy who can at least disperse the ball and do it, for the most part, with good discernment, they might be another one of those grit. They're a grit ball club, too, that if they just get something from that spot – they might be somebody you might have to tango with later on in the year. Yeah, Atlanta, I have my surprise pick in the NFC is Carolina narrowly misses out on the playoffs. I think that the, the Panthers are much improved. I like Dave Canales. I think that Bryce Young got a really raw deal last year. I don't believe in Bryce Young at all, but I do believe that they are going to narrowly miss out on the playoffs. That's my surprise pick. Um, and then I did take it a step further and chose some uh, uh, award winners as well. MVP, Jared Goff. 
like I said, 15 of his 17 games are going to be in a dome, I believe, and the other ones aren't going to be in the bad weather. So I do believe Jared Goff will win the MVP and show the LA Rams what they missed out on. Dan Campbell got one in the uh, Coach of the Year as they have the best record in the league. I have them going 13 and four this season. Micah Parsons getting the uh, defensive. Player of the year, he deserves it. He's he's due for one, honestly. He he in this uh, Mike Zimmer defense is going to be all over the field. I love it. I got to have one homer pick in there. Bo Nix being the offensive rookie of the year. I think that he's in a great situation with Sean Payton, and I'm really excited to see how they play this year. Kamari Lasseter, the Houston Texans pick uh, in the second round, going to be the defensive rookie of the year. And then comeback player of the year is really hard to decide because you have Aaron Rodgers, Joe Burrow, Anthony Richardson. You have a lot of quarterbacks coming back. I got Joe Burrow because I got them being the one seed in the AFC. So uh, that's what I got. I can't wait till I'm wrong, uh, like in 24 hours. And <laughs> so that's what it seemed like I was in the college football playoff. But that's what I got for uh, for the awards. Any any qualms there, Chuck? None whatsoever. I have a hard time picking my nose, so don't ask me to pick make those oh, I, kind of picks. I wasn't going to just stay I, with the team. I wouldn't dare. All right, let's get to UTSA Texas State. Obviously, I hope everyone has a wonderful uh, football season, but slightly less wonderful than the Denver Broncos. Please, um, UTSA playing Texas State this Saturday, three o'clock. The I thirty five showdown, the sixth iteration, has a lot of interesting facets to it, in my opinion. None more important though than the head coach connection between DJ Kinney, or excuse me, GJ Kinney and uh, Jeff Trailer, And I pulled up a shot from Monday where Jeff kind of illustrates how close these two actually are. As far as my relationship with G.J., I think that's pretty well documented. I mean, he was my quarterback, and he's like a son to me in every sense of the word. Uh, we communicate very frequently, and I don't really talk to very many head coaches. I mean, but he's one that uh, we talk to quite a bit. And... Um, I'm very happy for his success. It doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I coach with him at SMU. I coach with him at Arkansas. Uh, you know, I would probably say he would speak to me as a, one of his mentors or, or father figure like, and I would say the same of him. He's he's literally like one of my own kids. And um, I'll be rooting for him every single day until Saturday at 3 o'clock. I love the closeness of the two coaches. I really do. I do, too. I like the fact this is one hell of a matchup, too. I like that both of these coaches, whatever it is that makes them great coaches, obviously they probably pulled from one another over this time, and it's cool to see that Coach Trailer flipped UTSA and took them to a place they've never been before. GJ has done the same thing, and even though Texas State has been to the mountaintop before, it's been decades since they mm -hmm. were, you know – a a legit program that people were looking at and, you know, having wide eyes about, you know, and not to take anything away from, you know, there's been some in recent memories. I mean, what Coach Bailiff did when he was at Texas State, you know, a number of years ago. But to have this recent upsurge is so incredibly fun for people that went to school there and, you know, have your team relevant in some way, shape, or form. I'm super fascinated to see what's going to happen in this ballgame and who's – who does this mean more for? Which program? One, I, I don't know what – I can't answer that, I don't think. As close as uh, Jeff Trailer and uh, G.J. Kinney are, they haven't talked a lot this week. And we uh, Jeff was asked about that on Tuesday. Luis? I'm surprised we haven't, but no, we have not. I don't know if he's being a little – he might be being the old wily veteran on me right now, being a little – I don't know what he's up to. You're not going to make the first move? Oh, uh, if you know, I'll probably reach out if he doesn't holler at me by Wednesday or Thursday just to make sure he's not going to beat me too bad. All right, coach. Jeff is so oh shucksy doodles about things like he beat me too bad. Like you've beaten him five times, not him particularly, but UTSA. Right. I mean, UTSA is in a higher division, they're a better program than they have been for a longer period of time as of recent memory. Like, you don't have to play it off like that. This is all just coach. Posturing. Yeah. <laughs> it is, but I mean, I mean, this, me this is bad. difficult because these this game does mean a lot to both fan bases, right? But you know, there's some real life elements between these two, and you've done a very good job of highlighting it. But I mean, when you talk about GJ playing for Jeff and the circumstances that led up to that, which was GJ's dad getting shot in the abdomen because of a parent that was pissed off at him. 
and then GJ coming over and playing for Jeff after that happened. I mean, like that's how do you put into context that relationship when we're talking about a couple of football teams that want to win a ball game on Saturday. I mean, there's so many layers to this and I think both guys do a really good job of somehow trying to keep the focus on football without having to bring up some of those memories too, which I'm sure for either guy, you know, that, how do you navigate that kind yeah. of life situation? You so, kind of, you kind of have both sides of the, of the coin, right? You have the fan bases who I wouldn't yeah. say are being nasty, but are poking fun at each other on social media and, you know, five and yeah, oh, some and of five. it's really clever though. And it's clean, clever yeah, too. Really that's what I'm saying. They're not being nasty or right. anything, but there's a lot of smack talk going on. Right. And then you have the, res- the level of, of, incredible respect going on between GJ and Jeff. It's just, it's very, you know, yin to yang when it comes to looking at the game, but how fans are looking at it and just how the teams are looking at it. As far as on the field, um, UTSA has got to protect Owen McCown to win this game. The Texas state was 18th last year in sacks across the entire nation. I believe with 34 penalties can't happen, but you can't, you're going to have to outscore this team. Obviously, you have to outscore a team to win, but you're going to really have to have to light it up yeah. on the scoreboard this this week, and you can't do that if Owen McCown's running for his I life. I think Texas State's quarterback was running for his life, too, so I think there's some similar issues. But I think, you know, the old adage about teams making the biggest leap between week one to week two, I, you know, both of these teams will be ready. I was astonished at how well Texas State ran the football. I mean, it was almost like they were trying to give nothing away in the passing game, but – they didn't necessarily have to with as many guys that they had that had, you know, so many great numbers in terms of yards per carry. Again, I'm just fascinated because I didn't think last year GJ could flip it like he did at UIW. He did. I was also shocked with how good UTSA was last year. And damn it, Texas State hung right with them. I mean, and, you know, played the, the street brawl game, right? They matched the physicality. That was a tussle last year, one score game that was close right up to the end. So with both programs, I think we both believe that they're going to be good this year. Let's see some explosions on Saturday for all the right reasons. Two guys that like each other getting after it. My guys against your guys, you know, at the end we'll, we'll hug it midfield and say, see you again next year and let the best team win. Yeah. And I think the Texas state has a little bit of a, not detriment, but I know we're going a little long here. Sorry, uh, we are. Uh, <laughs> <It's cold. laughs> like, yeah, Luis needs a sweater. Um, well, I, we'll wrap it up here in a second. The Bobcats brought on a lot of transfers on defense. Obviously, you saw kind of some quirks of that last week against Lamar, allowing twenty-seven points. It's going to take a little while for those guys to mesh. I don't know how that's going to look on uh, Saturday. Are you going to need more time to mesh than a week and a half, two weeks? Uh, if they do, UTSA can put up points. They've shown that they can put up points, and they're going to go fast on offense. The key for the Roadrunners on defense, to me, is don't allow the Bobcats to score 35 points. It's pretty cut and dry. But last year they were seven or no when they scored 35 points, one and four when they scored, or excuse me, one and five when they scored less than or 34 or less. Can you stop this offense from scoring? Last year they did. 20 to 13 was the final. Can they do it again with a new quarterback? You got Jordan McLeod that comes in from James Madison. Yeah, so he one was of the a conference player of the year. Yeah, he right? was one of the best quarterbacks in college football last year. They led the uh, Sun Belt in yards per game and points per game. Can you stop them? That's going to be something I'm going to I'm going to want to keep track of. So, who wins? Damn. Line is nine again. is one and a half, two and a half for Texas State. Texas State is favored. UTSA will most almost certainly be the underdog in this game. That is to me the the most surprising thing of this all. So what does Vegas know that we don't? But it feels like a trap game. I will say UTSA by three. UTSA by three. Yeah. The t- and their it special pains teams. me to say that because I love GJ. I love my school. But I'm just going to go with skins on the wall. All right. I think UTSA. A little further along than what Texas State is as we sit here before the ball game. I'll let you know differently if it – flips the other way one thing i know is that it's going to be a close game i i feel almost certain to say that it's going to be close utsa it, only plays close yeah. ball games <laughs> and, and not only that i i think in a lot of ways because they got your squad coming in the week after asu baby but this is in a lot of ways this is going to feel like their super bowl there it will is. be many explosions in this game and i i would say that if you you know maybe not for the kids that 
aren't from around Texas and, you know, some of the transfers. But we're probably looking forward to showing ASU what they can do more than they are UTSA. But for the Texas guys, this and, – and I think for GJ, this is, this is literally – Super Bowl one for them. This is going to be fun. I will not be surprised if either team wins. But Me I, neither. But I think UTSA has enough to pull it out. It's just going to be, can they play a clean game? And can they capitalize on the mistakes that Texas State will make? Because they've proven that they will make mistakes, whether that's turnovers or penalties. I think they had 90 penalties last year for like yeah. 900, 900 yards. And yet still scored a gazillion points right. in the season. So it's going to be a really interesting weekend. It's going to be a really interesting game. Don and I will be back on Monday. I don't believe you'll be here because you'll be traveling back from Cleveland. So Don Harris and I will be back on Monday to talk about it. That's it for the Sneakers Cleats podcast today. Remember to download, rate, review, subscribe. Give us a five-star rating. Post pictures of my predictions on your fridge because they're going to be 100% accurate. Except I would love if uh, Chucks were more accurate than the AFC. We'll see you guys right back here on Monday.